Let me double check on the Rumble page and the YouTube page. Oh, I should probably set the chat. Looks like we've already got uh, Laroid X. Is yeah. that uh, is that how that's pronounced on YouTube in the chat? Welcome, welcome. And move this over here. And then double check on Rumble, pop out the chat on Rumble. And uh, hope everyone is doing well. I am joined this week by uh, Stephen Gosney. Um, you uh, may know him as an attorney. Um, uh, if I'm, if I remember correctly, you do um, appellate level public defenders for death row appeals. Is that right? Well, actually, most of my appeals are non-death row. I'm oh, death okay. qualified. I have done a death pay appeal, and I have another one coming in. So I'm part of. We have a team of three attorneys in our in our 13 county area and so when there's a death penalty appeal i will i'm part of that team and so i'm qualified to do that and i'm also qualified on death penalty jury selection and i'm part of the capital team but not you know we do a lot more than that we represent indigent clients on their appeals so most of my cases are just felony getting a lot of lifers people life in prison which is not so fun either right but i, I say if, you, if i'm your attorney you're in big trouble usually <laughs> yeah. but um, yeah so that's that's what i've been doing for about the past 12 13 years that's great um so we've got some guy in the chat on rumble and uh we are going to finish off this bottle of ghost gunner gin um are you familiar with with the with this particular brand I am not, you know, I'm not a gin drinker. I've, I'm okay. very particular. I drink very specific things. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you were, you were saying, if you want to drink, you can drink. Well, I, I drink if I get paid, you see. So if yeah. we sell books uh -huh. or, or CDs or law card or something, I don't know what, but uh, I'll be, I'm open to it, but I'm, it's not like I need to, I'm not a big drinker, you know, I don't want to spoil the party. So drink yeah. up. <laughs> I, uh, I only drink on weekends. Um, just so I limit myself and because right. it's not cheap. Um, I like gin, but this I did not realize when I bought it has lavender in it. So it mostly tastes like bath water. <laughs> Funny. And that's a heavy pour. Um, I had bought, I brought out for a second drink. Um, do you drink LaCroix? No, or see, I'm, not, I'm not really that sophisticated. I must so, say I, I like, there's one white wine. I like, I like a certain port wine. I like a certain mixed drink called a sidecar, which is people mm -hmm. know me as, right? And then I um and then I'll I'll I like certain things. There are certain like vodka mixed drinks that I can go with that are usually I the sweeter it is, the better I like it usually. Yeah. Well LaCroix is just the this flavored sparkling water um that uh, you can get at like Aldi. So this is like this is a lemon lime um generic Aldi LaCroix. Um so it's just it's sparkling water with a little bit of flavor, but I also have dirty mop water LaCroix. <laughs> it's a Coors. <laughs> Coors yeah. um, but I will not be drinking that because this was a heavy pour. So the thing about Navy strength gin, um, and I've said this, to, uh, some of the audience knows this already. Um, so back in the day, the, the alcohol in the ships was stored in the same room as the gunpowder. And, and the problem is the barrels would sometimes leak and get into the gunpowder. So to be Navy strength, it had to be um, high enough alcohol to not uh, damage the gunpowder. And in this case, it is 57%, um, but I think 52 and a half is the, the minimum required. Um, and that's where the term proof comes from. So 100% proof in... Uh, in European terms, is it means it's it's gunpowder proof. So that's what Navy strength is. It'll the gunpowder will still burn if it gets wet with that liquor. So this is close to sixty percent, which means I will not be capable of driving a car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good a good rule is if you have um, if you do drink, don't drive. I mean, that is correct. The, just make that a rule. That's yep. just the rule, you know. Yep. And, and I'm very fastidious about that. So yeah, that, oh, absolutely. I've seen even so have much damage that comes from from drunk driving. It's sad. When I told you before, uh, I li I used to live in Colorado, um, and in Colorado, you can actually get a DUI um, if you are within a hundred feet of your car and have your keys in your hand um, or on your person. Um, 
So if you are legally uh, at a blood alcohol level where you would get a DUI uh, and you have your keys on you, they say that is intent to to drive drunk. And so they'll give you the same DUI as if you'd gotten pulled over driving well, it's drunk. Almost, it's almost that bad in Florida. In Florida, if you are, say, asleep in your car and the car is operable, that mm -hmm. is DUI. So, um, and I had a case about this. <laughs> I've got a case on everything, but I don't really want to talk about <laughs> law. I want to talk about music. Man. Yeah, we're going to talk about music. So, I mean, everybody knows you as a as a lawyer, do uh, they? primarily. I mean, I, I don't would, know. what do they I know would, me as? I know you as a lawyer. Okay, you know um, me. <laughs> I mean, I I binge watch as much uh, as much stuff as I can, but you know, working a day job um, and having two kids, it's, I can't stay up and watch late, so it's on in the background while I'm working. Um, but. Uh, I also know that you are a bass player and yeah. uh, and a Rush fan. Uh, oh. Getty uh, Lee was my dad's primary influence to play bass. Getty Lee and yeah. Sting. Uh, yes, that's it, man. And I would add to that Steve Harris of Iron Maiden. Okay. My three main, my three main. I could play everything off of all the Police records. I could play everything off of all the Rush records through Moving Pictures, with the exception of just a couple songs. And then, um, and then I could play everything. Iron Maiden f through Power Slave, basically. Okay. That was my my training. Was yeah, my, I think my dad's a little bit older than you are. Uh, my dad is uh, 65. Okay, I'm 55, so, so I'm okay. 10 years younger. So that, that would probably be why like, his, his bass influence would be more late 60s um, to mid 70s. Sounds right, like well, then I, I'd put like my second tier <laughs> bass playing influences would be, let's say, Duran Duran. Okay. And um, good bass playing in Duran Duran. I don't know if mm -hmm. you know that, but um, yep, it's Tony Franklin from the Firm. Not heard of that. Tony Franklin, he's the fretless monster. In fact, okay. that right there, that's a Tony Franklin signature bass. <coughs> he's a signature precision bass. Okay, which is pretty cool to be a Fender endorsed artist. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and he he played with well, the Firm was the band that Jimmy Page formed after Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. So he played with Jimmy Page, Paul Rogers, and Chris Slade in the firm. Pretty oh, cool. wow. Yeah, that's a superstar lineup. And they did yeah. two albums, and it was phenomenal. And then, and then, um, and he's still actually, you know, I'm a buddy with his now on the internet. Nice. Yeah, because I, um, I saw, because I've, he was always one of my guys. I, I could never play. He was a fretless guy, and he was really, and I never played fretless. Mm -hmm. But he has a musicality, and I'd say a lyricism to his playing. When that, when that, because when the first Firm album came out and I was listening to it, I was lit. I was really a big, I'm such a huge Jimmy Page fan. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen to Jimmy Page, right? And the, I was just blown away by the bass playing. And I'm like, what's going on with this bass player? And so I, he was just so great. And, um, and recently, you know, a couple of years ago, I found out that he was on this cameo, you know, cameo. Yeah. And so I sent him a little note, like as a fanboy. I'm like, ooh, cameo, say hi, right? <laughs> and he gave me this full, like, 10 minute talk on. Wow. Stuff. It was really cool. It was like really a good deal for cameo. Cause I did another one with um, Frank, well, no, it was uh, David Ellison from Megadeth, you know, and it was like, rock on, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it was, that was it. I'm like, man, I was like, that was kind of. I mean, it was okay. I mean, but it was it wasn't great. So, but anyway, so I've been talking with Tony Franklin. He's like one of my buddies now, and I, you know, occasionally I'll cameo. Sometimes I'll just talk to him, and and I've got two Tony Franklin bases. This is the fretted one, and I have a a fretless one also. Nice. So, how did you? Um, let's go back to the very beginning. How does Steve Gosney get interested in music? Well, oh, that's a very good question. And this is what I, I have not told these stories before. And people know me for telling stories. <laughs> like Gosney's got a story about everything. And this is near and dear to my heart. Um, well, I will say I started out here. This is You're going to laugh. My original eight track tape collection consisted of the Bee Gees greatest hits. Okay. All of the Village People's records. And Michael Jackson's off the wall. <laughs> All right. All right. And that was, and that was, and that was my, and I liked Casey and the Sunshine Band and disco. And then I went over to, I had a friend who was a cool friend. I was not so cool. I was a nerd. And I had a cool friend who um, had a 
beautiful three pickup black beauty les paul and um he and his brother was really cool and i remember he loaned me zeppelin 2 and pink floyd's metal hmm. and it was like the gates of heaven opened up <laughs> you know and i traded all of those eight tracks to him for those two scratched up lps enough with the disco socks zeppelin all the way right and yep. so then i started collecting lps and records and uh, got mainly the big i'd say the big five bands for me were zeppelin rush yes pink floyd and the police okay um and so those were my main and of course um I just, you know, just got into music and then that was sort of, and so we, we get into like Rush, especially Rush and, mm -hmm. you know, Zeppelin is like my number one, I would say. Um, and so Jimmy Page, John Paul Jones also love his bass playing also. Um, but again, those are this, that, that second level or more bass players that I listened to and appreciated and would play some, but it wasn't so much a, a music, like a playing influence. Like when I play, I play sort of, Getty Lee, like Chris Squire is another one. I love Chris Squire, but he's above me. Mm -hmm. um, it's a reach for me to play Chris Squire. Um, but Getty Lee is right in my wheelhouse. Yeah. So so then I, I when we went to high school, um, you know, I, I picked up a guitar. I read a friend of mine who bought me a, or showed me a Hondo 2 electric guitar, which was a piece of junk. And, um, and I played, you know, for like six months, I was goofing around on the electric guitar and uh and everybody played electric guitar and everybody was better than me mm -hmm. so but every nobody played bass and everybody needed a bass player so yeah. i'm like okay so i'll play bass that's what my dad did the same, same way that uh he got into bass although his was classical guitar okay yeah well i had an electric it was it was a piece of junk and so i traded that in for a, a cheap precision copy i don't even know what the it wasn't even it was nothing it was terrible and um and i got and i got in with a band it was actually i think i was in junior high school and my brothers my older brother's friends had a band and of course they needed a bass player mm -hmm. and so we played in this this warehouse it was a von air air conditioning supply house and we had <laughs> on the top of like this inside the warehouse we put all our equipment on the top of this building inside the warehouse and we played and we we played all kinds of stuff i mean we practiced all the time mm -hmm. and it was, it was Jonathan Emery was the guitar player singer. He was kind of the main guy, Dave Martini on drums, which I will, I got to tell you about Dave because he went on to become a professional. And then um, we had a guy named Larry Mullis, <laughs> another character on lead guitar and then me on bass. And I had, you know, junk, but I was a young kid and these were all much old. These all were like three years older than me. Mm hmm and uh, we played, you know, all kinds of stuff. The Cars, Van Halen. Um, I can't even think. We we played. I have a whole set list. We had a whole set. We played a Petra song. Um, oh man, there's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> yeah, we played ten years after, and just all kinds of stuff. It's kind of the late seventies rock stuff. Mm -hmm. And so then we and we played a few parties. We played a few parties and you know that that was kind of the extent of that band but i mean we practiced a lot and i did play in that band a lot and it was it was a decent band we were actually not bad mm -hmm. um i was the, probably the weakest one of the group in fact it's funny because we had a a guy come in who was this professional guitar player guy and you know getting a band that's functional is pretty hard and mm -hmm. we had a consistent lineup and uh he came in and he had this i remember he had a, a white 50 watt Marshall half stack. Oh wow. It was a Jubilee edition. Mm -hmm. Nice equipment. And he yeah. had this, he had this Andy Summers guitar tone. And he could play like the the cars. That guy was just phenomenal. And uh and he, but he would look at me and he's like, we need to get rid of the bass player. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was struggling with, you know, everything. The cars was hard. <clears throat> Um, and he, so he didn't last, he just kind of came through, but I'm, I'm just giving you a kind of a flavor of it was a, I was in maybe ninth grade, right? Mm -hmm. Very young. So that's sort of the beginning. And I played in that band for a couple of years, I'd say, um, we feel free to jump off. I can just keep going if you want. 
Oh, um, that, that's that. That's part of my problem is that I can just I can listen to people all the time. I love hearing people's stories. That's why uh, okay, when I good. relaunched my channel, um, it was all about stories. Um, and so I, Bill, I, just, I got stories because nobody's heard this stuff. This is all first time. This is on your show. Exclusive Gosney stories here because um, it gets way better. <laughs> so well, I will tell you out of that band, Dave Martini, his mm -hmm. his family was owned the air conditioner supply place right okay and he was a photographer but he actually became a a, a circuit drummer for a band mm -hmm. called circus out of atlanta i've heard that name before yeah they were a, they were a club they were a circuit band they did the circuit in atlanta and uh he was the drummer he was the main instigator of that band and uh and he was my he was our drummer and it's funny because <laughs> well, you know the song uh, uh there's so there's so many funny stories you know when you're in bands you get great stories mm -hmm. And uh, what was the name of the, the song? Uh, don't, 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 don't. Oh, it's uh, Nazareth, Hair of the Dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and he could never play that beat. You know, that like with that cowbell going, that. Tuk, 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 oh, yeah. And, you know, that it's got that. Tuk, it's got kind of an odd beat and he could never get that beat. And our guitar player, Jonathan, who was a, he was a really good piano player, sang, played guitar. He'd get over there and like he like when we'd take a break, he'd sit over the drum set and start playing that beat. <laughs> <laughs> and then Dave would get you know, another funny story is like Dave would always drop his sticks, you know. And so we're in the middle of the song, we're grooving and everything's playing, and all of a sudden, like something's going on with drums, and you look back behind you and he's like reaching under, like trying to grab his <laughs> stick. <laughs> I only had one pair of sticks, so I didn't drop sticks. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So well, it was a uh an effort and I and I never could get my gear straight. I'll talk about another battle. There was a guy here who sold who had this junky guitar shop and I kept going back to him, get kept it. I, I, he, I lost so much money. I got ripped off so many times by that guy and um, never could get good equipment. Um, the first the first real instrument that I had, the first like great instrument I had was a 1979 rickenbacker 4003 okay and that was world class that that, that mm -hmm. bass was great that was my first one that i was like this is it you know and um i had an ampeg svt too but that would kill me that would that thing was so heavy mm -hmm. holy cow um and i i traded that bass for the number one bait my number one bass now i traded it for a specter stewart's and it's a specter brooklyn specter i don't know if you're familiar with specters mm -mm. well let me show you. And in fact, right. I, I I still I feel bad because I I, ne I want that Rickenbacker back, but because of thank you Andrew Bronca, I now have a replacement. Oh wow! Oh. Oh, my so this is my Rickenbacker four thousand three in blonde, just like the one that I traded. Nice, brand new. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that thing. This is a great, and this is my new number two, actually. I really like this bass. It's great. It, I love the sound. I love the play it plays. And this was, like I said, I love the Rickenbacker, but I don't regret the trade, and I'll show you the bass. So this is my number one. This, baby, is irreplaceable. That's gorgeous. This is the best instrument, the best bass I have ever played in my life. Look at the flame on that. Yeah. That's beautiful. Neck through body, three piece neck with maple, solid maple wings. And this is a Brooklyn Spectre. Now, if you don't know what Stuart Spectre design instruments are, this is an irreplaceable instrument. And it's the best instrument, a best bass I've ever played in my life. I used to, well, we'll get into it working in guitar stores. Um, so this bass, it was sitting on the wall on Music City for, for months and months. And um, you ever seen Sting in the Synchronicity Tour? I have not. He plays a white Spectre, Brooklyn Spectre. Okay. Um, and these were handmade by, it's an NS2 bass, which is a Ned Steinberger design. Are you mm. familiar with Ned Steinberger headless instruments? My dad had a Steinberger, um, the uh, the little one, the little graphite one that was, the body right. was this big. Right. He would he, he would hold that out and tell sound guys in the studio, "Hey, this is a this is a three thousand dollar bass. Be careful with this." Yes. And then when they would reach out, he'd just drop it on the floor. <laughs> because well, I, mean, those, that, I actually played. This was in competition with one of those Steinbergers. 
Wow. But this one is, this was an NS, NS is Ned Steinberger, and this was his second design. And he got with a fellow named Stuart Spector out of Woodstock, New York, is actually in Brooklyn at the time. And he designed a, he had the, spe, the, the Steinberger base, which was, everybody knows, the headless base. Mm -hmm. And then he wanted to do a redesign of the traditional Fender Precision types instrument. And this was the design he came up with, the curved body, you see that? Mm-hmm very lightweight it plays this thing plays great sounds great super phenomenal bass and the brooklyn ones there's only about well they, they only go up to about serial number 1300 okay so there's only about 13 and of those i'd say the only ones that are really good are about 800 to 1200 or eight way to 1200 there's about 500 good ones and um this is the prettiest the best i've never sat its equal and it's it's just i just love it I mean, you know, and that's a typical musician thing, right? You get fixated. Um, they sold out to Kramer, and the quality went way down. Mm. You remember? And Kramer went bankrupt, and then mm -hmm. he he went he they went bankrupt, and he, the, Stuart Spector started building custom bases under a different name called Stuart Spector Designs, but basically the same instrument. And I have my number two backup for this one is a Stuart Spector Design NS2. And then, uh, and now they've bought the bought the uh, name back, and now it's Spectre again. So you can buy these, but these are new ones are about seven grand. Mm -hmm. um, but this one is irreplaceable. Yeah, and uh, I love it. It's just my instrument is my number one, and I just just can't get enough of it. So that's that's you know you fall in love. So that's been my instrument for years. Um, yeah. So. Um we we I've got a question in the chat um sure. if uh oh that's not the right one um hang on uh Mr. Scott on Rumble uh, Mr. Scott Awesome says are there any bands that you liked as a kid but grew out of because you realized they weren't really good <laughs> that's a good question yeah I don't know you know I would say the opposite because when I was a kid like I said I dumped the Bee Gees and dumped Village People and and Lately, I mean, you know, I'd say when I got a little older and I didn't get, I got over the disco sucks thing. Bee Gees are amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of the Bee Gees. So, um, so I would say that's when I fell out of love with and then came back in. I don't know. They're bands that I probably not because the thing is my musical tastes get wider, not mm -hmm. narrower. I mean, I like classical. I like jazz. Yep. I like rock. I like electronic, like Tangerine Dream. Um, I like heavy metal and, um, everybody knows me as the metal guy, you know, but I have very wide ranging tastes, a rock, a band that I, I kind of, well, I'll tell you a band that another one that I didn't appreciate when I was younger that I do now is the Rolling Stones. Okay. I, I never really liked the Stones. We played some in that first band, but it was always like, eh, didn't grab me, but, um, but now that I've gotten older, I'd say in the last few years, I've listened to some and I have their whole catalog now. Hmm. So I've uh, never been a Stones or Beatles fan. Um, well, Beatles are another one. I love the Beatles. Um, uh, but I wasn't as into them as I, I came later. I kind of, I went through a Beatles phase and I'm kind of mm -hmm. out of that phase now. Um, well, I can appreciate what they did um, and and uh, the impact they had on on music generally. It's just not something I personally enjoy listening to. And I'm the kind of person that, um, like, if you like something that I don't like, fine. That Like, what what business of that is mine? Like the Beatles, like the Stones, I don't care. Like, I, I, just because I don't want to listen to it um, doesn't mean that other people shouldn't enjoy it. I'm not saying that they're terrible, obviously. Because, right. I mean, you don't become multiple number one uh, billboard sellers if you're legitimately terrible. <laughs> And some well, of the music I listen to, I don't know about that. I wouldn't go that terrible. far. I would say that there's a lot of junk out there. The well, pop, I suppose, the so. pop is just not good. Yeah, um, and you know, a lot of the music that I listen to is like from a music, um, music theory perspective. I listen to things like dubstep and hard style. The hard style is just a doom, 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 like, and it's all that. Like it's shit musically. It's just absolute bullshit, but I love to listen to it anyway. And I get it. Like I just, I like bullshit and that's okay. <laughs> it's a guilty pleasure, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I also like guys like Sabaton. Um, Sabaton is probably one of Sabaton and uh, 
uh, Amaranth are two of my favorite uh, bands right now. And Amaranth is uh, they're a metal group out of sure. Denmark. Right. Mm -hmm. Or Denmark or Norway. I can't remember remember which, but they they also mix a lot of like um, not electronica, but uh, more electro rock. But they're right. they're very hard. Um, yeah, and I found really. them because they uh, they covered a Sabaton song. See, I'm not into that type of metal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people have suggested a lot of bands and they're always in that kind of genre, mm -hmm. which is that symphonic kind of metal. And yep. that's not my, that, I, I don't really like that. Um, but it's okay. Like I said, I'm, it's, it's, there's no accounting for taste. It's like, I can't right. talk you out of it or talk you into it, right? You're just into it or you're not. Um, right. I'm kind of, I usually go into more of the progressive type metal or, okay. or gent or, um, shredders you know like i would say ingve early ingve momstein i like the mm -hmm. early ingve momstein um i like you know thrash um those are the metal genres i generally like classic metal which would be like priest mm -hmm. and maiden yep you know um megadeth used to be number one but i will say that this last album sucked <laughs> and i and i'm really sick of dave's lying and he needs he's all too old to be such a jerk and uh and so and i i've got to say that the new album really disappointed me him firing dave ellison as bass player really disappointed me and i i'm and his whole tack the way it's like the same old marketing thing i've heard a million times that he does to generate publicity i'm just over it um it's sad because i mean he i've seen Meg megadeth probably 10 times live in fact i saw him on the rust and peace tour which was their um, at a local bar, <laughs> you know, so, um, anyways, um, well back to, um, so music. So mm -hmm. in, during college, so then that was sort of my, my high school band, right? Right. If you want to keep here and this is oh, the, absolutely Let's you want to keep, keep, going. Going. keep going. musical background. Yep. So then I went into college and I, for a summer job, I worked at, oh man, well, I should say that I went to college. It was this great guitar player who played all these Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton licks on oh, a Strat. Oh, I love Jeff Beck. Oh my God. And he was so good. And I would just play like some stupid blues bass line and he would just go all night. But he got kicked out of school because he's a smoking weed in the dorms. Yeah. And that sucked. His name was Craig. He was great. Uh, best, bass, probably the best guitar player I've ever played with. And I was like, <laughs> damn it. Um, and then, um, I started working in a music store and uh, selling guitars okay. and, and basses. And so I could learn how to shred a little bit, you know, just some stuff enough to impress the guitar geeks. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, play like, I'll show you. So and this is my, this is my number one. And this I bought back when I was in my Strat. Okay. And this is, this is my favorite guitar. That's, that's the classic strat. And you what's that? That's the classic strat with the uh the, the flame. The, classic. the, the I love the, this. I love sunburst. things with a little interest. Like it's got a little mm -hmm. knot in there. I yep. love the, I love the wood. All my guitars are sunburst or natural wood. Like um what is it? I haven't played in forever, but <laughs> but this this thing is sweet, and I got that at my guitar shop I was at. And the nice. thing is is that I and on my Les Paul I got there too. Which um, you you know, I never made any money at that guitar shop. <laughs> Nobody makes money working in a guitar a, shop. <laughs> a running tag, you know, a running thing. And so when I was um, but this baby, that this is my guitar, and it's really not the perfect instrument. I will say it's got a lot of like problems. It's got it's got like the the the, the trim system always bothers me. Never, it's a little got a little tuning issue on the B string. Can never quite, and I like to really like you know wank on the on the trim like you know this sort of thing like, yep you know that sort of thing and that just and it's just out of tune right but it's just it's got character it's just i'm yep. just it's a lovely guitar and um so that's that one going back to that uh that steinberger when speaking of uh uh tuning my dad said that if you ever get the chance to get that headless steinberger um and at least play it, have fun with it. Cause my dad said he would change the strings and he toured Colorado, Wyoming, Utah. Um, and he, he would change the strings and tune it one time. Right. He didn't have to tune it again until he changed the strings. Well, that's like my specter. 
mm-hmm. vector base, it just never goes out of tune. Yeah. It's solid. It's solid. It's a rock. In fact, I'd rather not have a trim system. I'd rather just have a stop tail piece on my Strat. But yep. um, the, the good trim system is on my uh, Paul Reed Smith. Mm. If you want a great trim system, Paul Reed Smith's got it nailed. Locking nuts and it's a floating trim. That's the, that's the best trim system I have. But um, I'm not really a whammy bar guy, but yeah. I'm not really even a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned enough. Like, so I played in there and then I, I formed, well, here's the, here's, so here's the good story. Here's the one everybody wants to hear. Okay, real quick though. Um, we are at 30 minutes, so we're going to head over exclusively to Rumble. Um, and Fox, I see your question. Welcome back. I haven't seen you in a long time, but we're going to head over uh, to Rumble exclusively. I'm going to throw the link in the YouTube chat real quick. It's also in the description. If you want to hear the rest of the stories, and I can guarantee they're going to be good. Um, this one's good. You want to be there. Head over to that Rumble page, uh, the Arthur Nicks over on Rumble, and we're going to continue this over there. I'm going to put up a little splash screen for just a moment so I can make sure I cut off uh, YouTube properly. Where is that? I'm still getting used to StreamYard. Okay. Um, it is this one here, and uh, I'm just going to keep talking real quick. I just need to make sure that the YouTube is cut off correctly, and here we go. We're going to cut off YouTube in three, two, one.